Namaste. So, in the last episode, we talked about the four states of consciousness and the four views and how these are all expressions of Aum, or its expansion, the Panchakshara Mantra, Nama Shivaya. So, what is reality? What is real? This is the question answered by the Mandukya Upanishad at the deepest level. And Shankara's commentary and the Karika, the commentary of his great grand guru, Gaudapad, is very illuminating. And one should go through it. I've linked it in the video description below, so you can access it uh, and go through it yourself, which is highly advisory. <laughs> then you'll have a much better idea what we're talking about. So, what is real? Well, it depends on your point of view. Let me use a simple example. Say there's a valley surrounded by mountains. If I'm standing in the valley, I have a view of, you know, houses and cows and <laughs> the plants and trees, whatever is there in the valley. And I can see all the details and so on. But if I climb up the hill, if I start climbing the mountain, on the way up, I look back at the valley, it looks different. Now maybe I can see the entire village. Instead of individual houses and so on, I see the aggregate of everything and its possibilities, its limitations, its boundaries, and so on. If I climb still higher to the top of the mountain, then I look back at the valley and maybe I don't see any village anymore. It's all been absorbed and, and covered up by the various forms in the valley as a whole. But that's the point. From the mountain, I can see the whole thing. Then, let's say I fly over this mountain valley in an airplane at altitude. And I look down. What do I see? basically just a wrinkle in the surface of the earth with no details. The houses and trees and all of that are, are simply not visible. They merge into a single thing. So in the same way, when we're in jagrat consciousness, when we're in ordinary consciousness, material consciousness of the world, that's what jagrat means, the multitude of objects in the manifested world. When we're conscious of all these things through the senses, the body appears real, these objects appear real, all the actions and reactions, the causes and effects of the material world appear real and consequential. They matter to us. We care about them because they affect us in different ways. But then let's say I take a nap and I go into dream consciousness, svapna. Suddenly, that whole world of jagrat that we cared so much about is gone. We don't see it anymore. What we see instead are the latent perceptions and conceptions and desires and dreams that exist in the mind. Well, let's say then we, we continue our nap and we go into deep sleep. Well, suddenly there's no more even dreams. There's nothing. Yet we feel a kind of rest, a kind of peace, a bliss that is beyond any material happiness because it's, it's always there whenever we're in that state of consciousness. So this is Sushupti consciousness. And let's say I go even higher. Huh? 
I go, I get in my airplane and fly over in the state of Turia. In the state of Turia, basically, there is no valley. It's maybe just a mark on the, on the uh, surface of the earth. And there's no details, no objects. So in the same way, one who is in realization of Brahman doesn't see the world the same way that one who is in external uh, jagrat consciousness sees it and doesn't value it in the same way either. His relationship with the world is completely different. So what the Mundaka Upanishad is telling us is that these four states of consciousness are available all the time. Just consider, for example, let's say you're doing some routine task in the material world, you know, washing dishes or making your bed or just walking somewhere, and you start to have daydreams. You start thinking about your job or what you learned in school today or things you want to do, places you want to go. You start thinking about the labels and names of things. Like, I want to be the president of my company. I want to be uh, the valedictorian of my class. I, I am the owner of such and such uh, possessions. I am the, the doer of certain actions. And of course, desires, many, many desires. Uh, these are going on at the same time as we are walking or doing whatever activity in the world that is simply routine or ordinary, and we're not really focused on it. Instead, our focus is on the mind, on the internal reality. And from that point of view, things look different. The world is no longer a collection of discrete objects. Instead, it is what we think about it, what we feel about it, how we look at it, our ideas, our conceptions, our dreams. So this dream consciousness is also available in waking consciousness. And in the same way, while we're walking around and doing stuff in the world and, and thinking about it, there are so many things we're not aware of. We, we don't want to think of, for example, uh, that uh, taxes are coming or that death is coming or that uh, maybe we don't understand so many things in the world like God and consciousness and reality. <laughs> huh? And so these are put in the bucket of unconsciousness. This is sushupti. See, so there's sushupti consciousness all the time, even when we're awake. And in the same way, there's turiya consciousness all the time, every time, at all times that we are conscious of anything, which is all the time. <laughs> turiya is the substrate or the base all of all states of consciousness. And in Turiya, the difference is there is no object in Turiya. There is only the subject, the self, Atma. The self is aware of itself. So since it's aware, it's self-aware, there is no object. This is non-duality. This is enlightenment. This is Brahman. So these experiences or states of consciousness are there all the time, at least in waking consciousness. When we're asleep, of course, waking consciousness goes away. It seems to go away. It just means we don't have any attention on it. And the other states of consciousness seem to be more prominent only because of the disappearance of the Jagrat consciousness, which just means our attention is focused differently, that's all. 
if we go into meditation, we can see all of these things simultaneously. So this brings us to the second mantra of Mundaka Upanishad. Sarvang yetad brahma ayamatma brahma soyamatma chatushpat All this is verily Brahman. This Atman is Brahman. This Atman has four quarters. So all this, everything we see, everything we experience, everything we think or feel or desire, our, even our sleep, is Brahman. These are just different states of consciousness. And consciousness is always the same. In fact, consciousness is the one thing that is always the same. Everything else changes. The, the relative importance of the different states of consciousness change as we go from waking to dreaming to sleeping to dreaming to waking <laughs> back and forth. And similarly, the things that we desire in the world are always changing. Our actions are always changing. Our thoughts about them are always changing. None of these things are permanent. They're all temporary. Therefore, the Vedantic view is that they are illusion. They're not real. Their reality is only relative. It's only partial. And their reality is derived. It's derivative from Turiya. Without Turiya, none of it would even exist. So in the same way, there are four views of Shiva. I hope you've stayed with us all the way to this point, but I had to explain all those other things so that this makes sense. When we're in Jagrat, or external consciousness, Shiva appears like the great Lord, the God of the universe, the creator, the maintainer, the destroyer. Uh, he is cognizant and aware of everything. And he controls everything by means of his infallible will and omnipresence and omniscience. So when we look at Shiva from that point of view, this, this is basically the Puranic view of Shiva. The Puranas view Shiva as an historical figure who is basically the creator of the universe. However, when we go into Swapna consciousness, then we start to feel like we have a relationship with Shiva. We can be Shiva's servant, his friend, one of his caretakers, or, or even his lover. We can have all kinds of different relations. In fact, we can have even several different relations with Shiva in different forms. This is the realm of bhakti, which is this, the realm of dream consciousness. See, it doesn't matter that these things are just thoughts. On the level of our personal perception, they are real. What's real is real to you when you perceive it. So, like for example, when you're in a dream, whatever happens in the dream seems absolutely real at the time of the dream, isn't it? Then when you wake up in waking consciousness, you say, oh, that was just a dream. Why? It's temporary. When the dream ends, it's over. That reality goes away. And the same is true of our other thoughts. But still, when the object is Shiva, this is a special category of thoughts because Shiva is equivalent to Brahman. And Brahman is the permanent existence, the real existence, the absolute, which means absolutely real that from which all other realities are derived. Then, when we go into the higher state of consciousness, sushupti, 
then we start to look at everything that is impermanent as non-existent. And this is why uh, the Vivartavada, the view of the yogi, the meditator, is that the world is maya. That means the world does not really exist. It's illusion. And that's because from that point of view, the only thing that's real is consciousness. And all these different objects are simply reflections of the original consciousness, which is myself, Atma. That's why the shloka I just read said that this Atma, this myself, is Brahman. And this is the aim of meditation, Raja Yoga. And then finally, in Jnana Yoga, one realizes Brahman and comes in direct consciousness of the self, as oneself. The self with a capital S, huh? the self of all. This is Brahman. So from the point of view of the worldly person, Shiva is a great and terrible god. From the point of view of the bhakta, he is the most lovable object, the greatest master or friend or lover. From the point of view of the meditator, the Raja Yogi, Shiva is the fount of consciousness. And from the point of view of Brahman, well, there is only Brahman. <laughs> and there is no action. There is no possession. There are no objects. There is no consciousness. Uh, because there are no objects, there are no consciousnesses either of any state. All these things go away. Time and space, objects, actions, they all disappear in Brahman. Now, again, all these states of consciousness, all these levels of reality are available to us all the time, and especially in the waking state. So we have to deal with them all simultaneously. And this is the state of the enlightened one, the Jivan Mukta. He is liberated, but also living in the world. And so he deals with all these levels of reality appropriately according to their nature. And so the same is true of his views of Shiva. He can hold all these views. Someone said, intelligence is the ability to hold simultaneously contemplating a different, even contradictory views in the mind. So if you can simultaneously hold the Jagrat, the, the Svapna, the Sushupti, and the Jnana view of Brahman, if you can hold these and relate to them appropriately at the same time, this is the highest state of enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.